Welcome to Ukrainian Institute London. Uh, I am Marina Pesenti, Director of Ukrainian Institute, and we are delighted to welcome Andrei Kurkov uh, with us today. Um, just a few words about ourselves. We are a UK registered charity um, contributing to a well informed debate about Ukraine in this country. Uh, we are affiliated with the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. Uh, we organize regular events <coughs> about Ukraine. We also run a language school, uh, which is taking place upstairs <coughs> at the moment as we speak. Uh, we exist uh, thanks to the uh, donations from the public and sponsors. If you would like to support us and to the regular free events that we organize, you're welcome to make a donation uh, to this box. So, our guest, Andrei Kurkov, we are very pleased to have him. Uh, he's a writer, a journalist, a very well-known person in Ukraine and beyond. Uh, travels all the time, uh, comments on Ukrainian affairs in English, in French, in German, I think, as well. Uh, he's an author of 19 novels. Some of them are for sale here. Uh, some of them are in, um, most of them are in Russian. Uh, one of the novels, Big Ford's Fuse, is in English. In fact, two books in Ukrainian also. And two books in Ukrainian. Yeah, in fact, Big Ford's Fuse is, was written about 25 years ago, right? 30. <laughs> 30? <laughs> yes. So it actually uh, was written at the Soviet Union times. Yeah. And yeah. partially it deals with the topic of Soviet mentality. And we will talk about mentality and identity uh, a lot today. So the topic of today's um, uh, talk is um, the place of Russian language and literature in the uh, current Ukrainian identity. Um, which is, has been undergoing lots of changes since Maidan. And it's something that is discussed a lot in Ukraine, and Andrei comments, uh, Andrei comments on it uh, a lot, uh, frequently in Ukrainian media, and not only. He's just been to the uh, Salon du Livre, the French uh, Paris book fair, uh, where for the first time ever Ukraine had, had its stand, and he was a very active participant there. Um, I actually would like to say that uh, I brought two books from my home collection, <laughs> which I read a long time ago, and this is the favorite book of my children, uh, which is in Ukrainian, about a hedgehog, so I hope to get an autograph <laughs> after that. <laughs> so, and I'd like to pass the floor to Andy. And now to the most probably controversial topic, which can be discussed in Ukraine or outside Ukraine if you mention Ukraine in this context uh, because uh, you know that Russian language became some kind of for, for, for many not only for some Ukrainians but, but for even for Kazakh intellectuals uh, became a red uh, flag to either to deter or to to, to, to frighten or to get angry uh, and uh, the, the, the story actually of uh, uh, s not status but discussion about Ukrainian uh, uh, Russian language in Ukraine is is quite complicated and uh, uh, quite long because uh, as you know in 19th century there were uh, in the middle mid 19th century uh, more than 40 laws were uh, proved by Tsar Alexander II, I think, uh, banning Ukrainian language from official use, from printing, from uh, publishing, from uh, public places, etc. So, from 1853-54, uh, there was permanent pressure on Ukrainian language, uh, which was not letting Ukrainian language to develop, and uh, the only a uh, small group of uh, Ukrainian intellectuals who were trying to save the language were the uh, writers who were writing in Ukrainian, uh, so the repre representatives of Ukrainian classical literature, who didn't have uh, a lot of readers, so it was uh, like uh, fighting almost in, in vain. And one of the writers like this was Ivan Franco, uh, who was fluent in German, and in some other languages, but was written in Ukrainian. Uh, I will not probably mention everybody, but but you you, you know that there is not such a case or such a, a phenomena as a happy Ukrainian classical writer. I mean, not only <coughs> not only because of this, they all, all the classical novels or poems they are quite sad and. Uh, 
pessimistic and uh, because of this not very much liked in the Ukrainian schools by the school children. Uh, but also the biographies of the writers are very tragic, very often uh, starting with Taras Shevchenko, uh, who was uh, practically a slave soldier in Russian army for 25 years and finishing uh, with Lesa Ukrainka, who was a brilliant poet and dramatist and died very early uh, from tuberculosis. But uh, I don't want to <coughs> go deep in the, in the history. Uh, what, what happened in, uh, in the Soviet time? It's, it's quite interesting because you know that Lenin was never uh, trying to come to Kyiv. He didn't like Ukraine, he didn't consider Ukrainians loyal or good Bolsheviks. And uh, at the same time, uh, there were several uh, Ukrainianizations uh, supported by Bolsheviks in 1920s until very tragic uh, move from Kharkiv, uh, of the capital of Ukraine from Kharkiv to Kyiv. And then even in the 1960s, in the end, the only sphere of Ukrainian language which was allowed and supported was Ukrainian language Soviet literature. And I remember uh, my own experience because after graduating, uh, graduation from the Foreign Languages Institute in Kyiv uh, and after working as an editor, I got a job as an editor of uh, translations uh, of literature from foreign languages into Ukrainian uh, in the state publishing house Dnipro which is uh, uh, still situated on Gold, near Golden Gate. I don't know if they published something or not. And I remember actually walking to the office, meeting my colleagues, uh, who were also editors, Ukrainian editors, and uh, speaking with them Russian on the street. And once you enter the door of the publishing house, you automatically switch into Ukrainian, and then you, you, you speak and you work with Ukrainian language until 6 p.m., and then you leave and you, and you start speaking Russian again. Uh, it's not about everybody because I, mean, I think probably half of the editors were real Ukrainian speakers who uh, spoke Ukrainian at home and in the street. But uh, in the street in Kyiv in 1983, 84, 85, it was very difficult to hear Ukrainian language. It was almost uh, extinct. 90% uh, of the schools in Kyiv, and at the same time, uh, at that time there were about 280 schools, uh, 8 or 10 schools, 90% uh, were Russian schools, probably less than 10% were Ukrainian schools, and uh, in my school where I studied, uh, it was a Russian language school, and we had only one uh, boy from Ukrainian speaking family, and I got so surprised that actually, well, he speaks a different language, I understand, but <laughs> nobody else speaks around. So I, I got excited to, to the uh, stage that I decided to learn the language, because uh, it was taught. You actually could uh, have classes in, uh, in the school, but for many kids it was not ob obligatory, because if you were a uh, son of an officer or from the family of military people, you could say that, sorry, I will not study this local language because my father can be sent to Kazakhstan tomorrow and then what? Should I, then I will be studying Kazakh language. Uh, and uh, I, I remember the, 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 the way the, the kids in the school treated the language. So, I mean, they, they were able to say something, but nobody took it seriously because it was not a real language. And suddenly, after independence, uh, the abrupt change. The, 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 the first law uh, when the language became a state language uh, meant that uh, you had, when you needed some papers in the offices, either of communal offices or in passport offices, you had to fill the forms in Ukrainian language. And this was the first uh, shock for the older generation of citizens of the Soviet Union who became automatically citizens of Ukraine, who never spoke or wrote Ukrainians, so some of them were helped by their children, some of them were helped by uh, different officials, but th there was already a, a bit of uproar. And from, from this point, uh, some politicians who uh, understood that they, they, they can actually go into parliament uh, with the idea of defending uh, Russian language or demanding that this language becomes second state language. This is the beginning of this story of instrumentalization of the language uh, 
uh, not for the cultural purposes, but for political purposes. And uh, since then, actually, uh, the Ukrainian political parties were divided, not uh, according to their political ideas, not liberals and conservatives, but those who are for Russian language as a second state language, and those who are against Russian language as the second state language. And actually, it was going on for uh, 20 years. Every president except Yushchenko, before the elections, would promise to make uh, Russian language second state language in order to get votes from the eastern uh, Ukraine and from Crimea and after becoming a president they would just slowly forget about it understanding that that will create the situation uh, of complete instability because for the Ukrainians in uh, the west of the country and west of the country was only 40 years under Soviet rule the language was and is religion and it's, it's another topic, and I, one, once I, I hope to be able to write a sh small non-fiction book about language as a religion, because uh, it's not only about Ukrainians. It can be a book about Catalans, uh, about Russia and Russian language, etc. And uh, in the last uh, years after Orange Revolution, uh, there was some kind of harmony uh, People were trying not, and politicians were trying not to, to uh, stress this sort of language difference too much. But of course, nobody was talking about the status of Russian language uh, and the fact that Yanukovych did manage to uh, to get through the parliament a law on the regional languages, regional minor minority languages, which was actually. Uh, accepted and written in order to give uh, to the Russian language status of regional language, which was already de facto, it was a regional language because there were regions where almost only Russian was spoken or Russian and other languages were spoken. But because it was, uh, of course, uh, Yanukovych who pushed to have this uh, law accepted, so the, this law became uh, hated by the intellectuals and by the <coughs> nationalists uh, two times more than if it was somebody else who would uh, defend this law. Now this law is finally uh, made uh, void by the Constitutional Court. So there is uh, a status of uh, state language as always uh, is only with the Ukrainian language. Uh, Russian has no status, and the minority languages, they, they have status according to the constitutional uh, constitution. But in, in the constitution, it says that uh, the main language, the state language, is Ukrainian, and uh, uh, the country or the state guarantees uh, free development and use of minority uh, Russian and minority languages. Uh, this, uh, of course, I mean the. I can see some reaction already, <laughs> but I, I, I should say that I was always against Russian language as the state language because otherwise Ukrainian wouldn't survive because Ukrainian cannot compete with Russian language and because Russian language has different center. Uh, the the acad academic center of uh, uh, Russian language is in Moscow and uh, the language as a religion and as a political instrument is used much more by Russia uh, than uh, Ukrainian language used by Ukrainian government. But uh, recently I, I got uh, suddenly uh, attacks from both sides because uh, my idea was that uh, you don't need to give special status to, to Russian, neither regional nor state language, of course not state language, but uh, we should take away the Ukrainian version of Russian language from uh, Russian control. So to divide uh, it uh, geographically along the border. And uh, for that you need uh, to create a small institute of Russian language or Russian language and languages of minority languages. And uh, to employ three or four philologists who could uh, work scientifically uh, defining the differences between Russian, proper Russian and Ukrainian <coughs> Russian, uh, fixing the changes and uh, creating new norms because uh, Ukrainian Russian is very different from Russian Russian 
and not only in the political sense but in linguistical sense. Uh, there are lots of Ukrainianisms. So, so, I mean, Russian in Ukraine was developing always under influence of Ukrainian language, Polish language, uh, different dialects of Ukrainian language in Bukovina, and even under influence of Hungarian and Slovak languages in Transcarpathian region, in Uzhgorod area, Berigova, etc. And uh, uh, the, I would uh, divide, actually, Russian language speakers in Ukraine into three categories. Uh, without trying to discriminate neither. But uh, in fact, actually, if we talk about uh, Donbass and Crimea, these Russian speakers are also representative very often of Russian ex-Soviet collective mentality. So for them, the source of language is the proof that the source of information is right. That's why actually they, they were always uh, trust in Russian uh, television, Russian radio, and uh, trying to read proper Russian writers from Russia, etc. Uh, in Kyiv, in Dnipro, in Odessa, in Transcarpathian language uh, region, you have uh, uh, Russian language speakers of Ukrainian mentality or European mentality, individuals who are not uh, connected uh, mentally with the Soviet past and who don't trust necessarily the information in the language they speak. So, I mean, they are used to take different sources and different languages as sources. I mean, for Transcarpathian region, it's normal to speak three languages. Uh, for, for Kyiv it's, uh, and for Odessa, it's normal to speak Ukrainian and Russian or speak Russian and understand completely well Ukrainian. <coughs> For Donbass and Crimea, it was not normal to speak any other language except Russian, and it is uh, still uh, quite a rare case. But I remember in 2010, uh, I was invited by uh, Renat Akhmetov, the, the richest man in Ukraine, who lives in Kyiv now, but quite discreetly, without making public statements. And uh, I was invited to, to give a talk uh, to the business community uh, on Christmas Eve, sort of to entertain them intellectually. So I, I read for them uh, a Christmas story that I wrote some years ago. And I was uh, quite puzzled by the uh, setting of the evening, because it was uh, organized in the lobby of the uh, Premier Palace Hotel, the Sakhmetov's Hotel at that time was the best in Donetsk, but there were no chairs, so all these representatives of business community, they had to stand all the all two hours. Some of them were 80 years old, I mean they were the Soviet directors of mines or factories, and some of them young ones. And uh, there were my books also <coughs> on sale, and uh, books were in Russian and in Ukrainian, and uh, several uh, and as business people of, of uh, younger age, like 30 or 40 years old, were buying books in Ukrainian and asking me to sign to their children, and they were uh, proudly telling me that the the kids already speak Ukrainian. But they, I mean, of course, they themselves didn't speak, and they they probably were not planning to uh, learn. But they were accepting that uh, this is the tendency, a and this was the tendency. Actually, it is still the tendency. So uh, I think uh, now we have in Kyiv probably 50-50 uh, Russian speakers and Ukrainian speakers, and uh, 15 years ago probably there would be 80% of Russian speakers and 20% of Ukrainian speakers. So now in the street you can actually uh, hear both, but at the same time a lot of a large percentage of younger uh, generation is completely bilingual. The uh, so uh, w when I actually gave several interviews on the topic of creating this small institute, uh, not separate, maybe as a part of Science Academy uh, Institute for uh, Ukrainian Language and Literature or Potibnya uh, uh, Institute for Linguistics, uh, of course I was uh, accused of uh, trying to create new form of Russification. And uh, I didn't know that actually these uh, interviews were publicized so much in, uh, in Russia that uh, the idea was even discussed in Soviet Federation, the Council of Federation, on the highest level. And uh, they called uh, my ideas uh, philological fantasies. 
which meant that actually Russia cannot uh, accept that somebody will take part of uh, Russian language culture, which doesn't belong geographically uh, to Russia, take it away under some, uh, from, from Russia's control. In, in fact, actually, it was quite painful for Russian Federation, for Russian intellectuals, to accept uh, Russophony, Ruskayazich, uh, until 2005 or 2004, when they finally recognized that actually not everything which is written in a Russian language belongs to Russian literature or to Russia. And uh, uh, the, the first institution which decided to support uh, not Russian literature but Russophone, Russian speaking literature, was Yeltsin Foundation. And they organized the first literary prizes for translators uh, abroad from Russian language uh, into different languages. And such a prize exists also in London. Uh, the prize Russophony exists in Paris, etc. So now, now it is already not uh, discussed. And the process is quite normal because uh, the, the story of Russian language repeats the story of French language. Uh, 160 years ago, uh, French language literature uh, lost, or France lost monopoly on the French language literature. Uh, in Belgium, Belgian writers in French never became French writers, although France was always trying to privatize the best chansonnier, like Jacques Brel. I think half of French people will say he is still more French than Belgium, than Quebec, and uh, Maghreb, the countries of uh, Northern Africa, where after uh, liberation or after becoming independent part of intellectuals st decided to continue writing in French language. So, I mean, they, they write Arab literature in French language. Uh, Russian language uh, has more complex history because the first emigration, Soviet emigration of Jews to New York in 1970s uh, created an island of Soviet Russian language which still exists and uh, I'm not sure there are books written in this language but there are newspapers in Brighton Beach area uh, published in the Soviet language with uh, proper uh, Soviet Jewish accent and humor <laughs> and it doesn't develop so you can conserve, I mean it can be conserved, it can be like fixed and uh, live without development but at the same time the language uh, which is used now by three or four million uh, citizens of Israel is developing and it's definitely becoming different from Moscow Russian language. Uh, Russian language in Lithuania and Baltic states uh, is becoming different. Everywhere it is influenced by the uh, mentality of people uh, who, who live there, uh, by the local languages. and. Uh, uh, still, uh, everywhere where Russian language is spoken, there is a feeling of danger that, this, that the language can be spoken too loud or that the language can uh, bring the messages uh, and ideas which don't belong to, to this place. And this is the main danger actually for, uh, for Ukrainian, Ukrainian speakers because for them, uh, especially on social Next, uh, and in, in Facebook, Ukrainian uh, Russian language remains language of occupants or language of enemy. Uh, there is no discussion about uh, Russian language minority or part of population in Ukraine. And uh, unfortunately, when you have so much hate speech circulating, uh, you, I mean, uh, and this hate speech is not actually neutralized or uh, not, uh, I would say, softened or dis uh, c uh, commented on by the politicians, by the, by the government. So this part of the population can feel uh, insecure. And they will take revenge, I think, uh, when it comes to parliamentary elections and presidential elections. So the better, actually, uh, the language is discussed openly and uh, somehow uh, the Russian speakers who are not intellectual, who are not educated, but who are just speaking uh, Russian at home and in their uh, towns and cities, 
if they continue feeling themselves as representatives of the other side, of Moscow side, uh, it will probably guarantee that uh, the future of Ukraine will not be as bright as one hopes. So th that's why actually this is one of the reasons of my uh, interviews on this topic. The other thing is that uh, uh, Russian language in the Soviet time was always uh, inter-ethnic language. So the Russian was used between Buryats and Tuvins in Dagestan everywhere. And it's interesting that in Ukraine you have a Russian as inter-ethnic language in Odessa region, in Bessarabia, where we have a lot of Moldovans, Gagaus, uh, Bulgarians, Greeks, etc. They speak between each other a Russian language and uh, in the houses their own languages. But Ukrainian language managed to become inter-ethnic language in Transcarpathian region. <coughs> so the Ukrainian Hungarians, if they speak other language than Hungarian, it will be Ukrainian. And unfortunately there is no policy uh, also of state support and promotion for the Ukrainian language in non-Ukrainian language speaking areas. So we have much more uh, statements and uh, some kind of appeals uh, from the activists uh, that everybody should switch into Ukrainian uh, without a uh, real volunteers movement to set up free courses of Ukrainian or to go and to work in Russian speaking areas just to uh, let people listen, just simply listen to Ukrainian language in the streets, in the cafes, etc.